proper uh, safety guarantees for, for control. So now we're joined by uh, Stephen Tui, who's momentarily um, a research scientist at Google Brain in New York. So before that, he, he did his PhD in, in Berkeley, and this is also the time where he uh, provided all of the, the, the results which motivated, I think, many of us to, to look into this field. So it's, it's quite uh, remarkable to have him uh, with us today. So I will not waste any more of, of his time and just uh, give him the floor to continue with the, the great stuff you already saw by, uh, by Nicola. So uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for being here. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to give these uh, summer school uh, lectures. Um, Nikolai and I had a very fun time planning these lectures, so uh, I hope uh, you have enjoyed the first part, and I hope you will also enjoy the second part. So now uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and so Nikolai kind of laid a lot of the foundations, uh, foundational tools uh that um that we talked about the first time and now i'm going to switch to kind of applying these tools to various problems in learning and control so we'll call these quote unquote applications uh but this will be a very theoretically driven talk uh so let's get started so uh, as i sort of mentioned in part one we covered a lot of foundational tools like concentration inequalities uh uniform convergence and nonlinear stability theory and now we're going to focus on applying these tools to several applications First application is a problem of learning a stability certificate from data. The second application is going to be a stability, well, what we like to call stability constrained imitation learning. And the third application, if we have time, uh, I hope we'll have time to get to this, but we'll then also, I, I will cover some uh, results in doing regret bounds for adaptive nonlinear control. Uh, so let's get started. So we'll start with the first problem, which is a, uh, learning stability certificates from, from data. And this is a paper uh, that we wrote last year with Nick Bofi, uh, Nick Motney, and John Jacques Lotin and Vikas Sinwani. Uh, it appeared in Coral. And so the motivation for this work is really that, you know, we've seen a lot of very impressive demonstrations of, uh, you know, a control, learning to control on robotic application systems. Uh, like, you know, Boston Dynamics has done a lot of really cool stuff. You know, self-driving cars are up and coming. Even back in the like 2000s, Peter Beal and Andrew Ng did a lot of really cool stuff with helicopters, uh, you know, like uh, and now people are started looking at like playing tennis and like, you know, doing uh, robots in, in home in the home. So the question is, we have all these really cool demos, but like, how do we actually get these demos out into the real world at scale, right? It's one thing to like cook up a demonstration in your lab. It's a very self-contained environment, but it's another thing to actually deploy these things out in the real world uh, where, you know, lots of uh, you know, things can happen. Um, and so this is obviously like one of the, you know, biggest questions in robotics. And I'd say that a lot of the research is focused on in sort of tackling this question, really like how do we improve the algorithms? How do we build better models of dynamics and better simulators that are more faithful? And, you know, while that's all great, um, I think there's been, at least from my point of view, say less emphasis on what I like to call like provable stability and safety guarantees, right? And in my opinion, like understanding limits here uh, to like the systems we design is really key to real world deployment, right? If we don't have understanding of what we can't do with these systems, then, you know, we become much more hesitant to actually deploy these out in the real world because uh, we don't really know what could happen. And so in this first part of the talk, I'm going to focus on an algorithmic framework for basically uh, provably generating uh, certificates uh, from a, of, of a dynamical system. And I'll define what I mean by certificate. Uh, but we're going to do this from trajectory data. So we're just going to basically just have rollouts of a dynamical system, and we're going to try to actually get a, a provable learning certificate from this trajectory data. OK. So let's be a little bit more concrete, set up some notation here for this problem. So the underlying object of this problem is going to be this dynamical system. It's going to be an autonomous dynamical system evolving in continuous time. Uh, so it's going to just, we'll, just, we'll represent that as x dot. Uh, equals f of x, where x is going to live in uh, n, rn, so we have an n-dimensional vector. Uh, we're going to use this notation throughout this talk, which is the c of t of psi, which is going to be this flow map notation, which indicates the, the state at time t in some interval big T, where we initialize the dynamics at x0 equals psi. And the psi initial condition is going to live in some set x. Okay, so this is just saying 
you know, what's the state of tie X of P, you know, when I start at, at some uh, initial condition psi. And what we're, we're also going to attach to this problem, a certificate function space, which is a set of functions that are uh, continuously differentiable that map uh, real uh, Rn to the reals. So this V of X uh, is going to be the, 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 the certificate space that we're going to search over uh, to get our certificate. Uh, and part of this is that um, we're also going to uh, attach to this an, what I call an evaluation function H, which is basically going to take trajectory data um, and, and kind of spit out a scalar number. And we're going to want that scalar number to be less than zero. And when that happens, we're going to say, you know, our certificate is satisfied. And when that scalar is greater than zero, uh, we're going to say the certificate's violated. So the goal of our problem with this notation is to find a V in the script V such that along this entire flow, so for all initial conditions X and for all time T uh, in the interval of existence of this ODE, we want this evaluation function along the trajectory uh, and it takes four arguments. So the arguments here are, are the state, the derivative, the, the certificate at the state and the gradient of the certificate at the state. And we're gonna want this evaluation function to be less than zero for all time. So that's the goal. And we'll see why this is a meaningful criterion to, to try and satisfy in a second. Okay, so right, why we want this? Well, V is going to be used to certify desirable system behavior. Right, and so kind of the most classic or basic condition we can sort of certify is this idea of Lyapunov stability. And Lyapunov stability is basically, we're gonna write two conditions down that imply that the origin is locally asymptotically stable. And the conditions are uh, that V is positive and V vanishes at the origin. And furthermore, the more important condition is that the Lie derivative uh, or essentially inner product of V, uh, uh, grad V with the dynamics F is going to be less than some class K function uh, around the origin. So if this condition A and B is satisfied, then a very uh, very classic result is that the, the origin is locally asymptotically stable, meaning that all trajectories that kind of start originate within a ball around the origin will converge at some rate uh, specified by this class K function to the origin, okay? And so that's very classic. You can kind of generalize this a little bit more where if you don't care so much about convergence to the origin, but you care more about set invariance. So if you're thinking in a safety context where I don't really care that I need to get the origin, I just not, I need to not leave some set. I need to not say like hit the walls of the room. Then you can use what's called a barrier function, which is similar to a Lyapunov function, but it's, it's kind of a weaker notion. And what a barrier function says is that we're gonna give you two conditions that imply that the super level set of a function is invariant. And these two conditions are, that first of all, when the function vanishes, so v of x equals zero, the derivative or the gradient does not vanish. And this is a bit of a technical condition to apply Nagumo's theorem. And the more important condition is that the Lie derivative here is actually greater than negative alpha of v of x for all x in the super level set of the uh, Lyapunov, uh, the, the barrier function. So if you have conditions A and B holding, then uh, Nagumo's theorem basically tells you that if you start within this, the super level set script C, then you will be forward invariant in the set, meaning that the flow will stay in the set forever. And so if the super level set is contained within a safe set uh, that you want to remain within, then this gives you a certificate that your dynamics will never actually leave the safe set. And so our goal is going to be basically to learn these type of certificate functions by observing trajectories of the dynamical system. Okay. Um, right, so that's uh, basically with that notation, so let's kind of tie in these Lyapunov and Bayer certificates to this evaluation function notation. And so recall, we were wanting to find a V such that H is less than zero along the trajectories. And so if we care about Lyapunov stability, then we would set our H to be the inner product of grad V and X dot plus that class K function uh, alpha. And if we cared about barrier functions, we would basically negate this quantity above. And uh, uh, Nikolai may have talked about incremental stability. If not, I'll talk about it later, but we can also kind of handle incremental stability, which is notions of convergence of pairs of trajectories toward each other. And we, we can easily modify our framework to do this, but I will just kind of focus on the single trajectory setting for now. But if uh, this is something you care about, incremental stability, note that this also falls within this framework. So this is a very general framework for sort of getting, you know, nice certificate uh, type of guarantees that we would want in control. Okay, so I'm gonna make a slight digression here because you probably have seen something like this before. And when you see something like this before in the literature, a lot of times 
this is associated with, say, sum of squares programming, right? And so you might ask the question, why do we need to do this from trajectory data? Why don't we just use sum of squares programming if we know the dynamics, right? And so given knowledge of the dynamics F, a very common use of sum of squares programming is exactly to search for this V that satisfies H less than zero using sum of squares programming, right? And because exactly the, you know, if you want to certify some polynomial of less than zero, this is a perfect use case for sum of squares programming. Um, so there's caveats here, right? So the first caveat is that it's restrictive in that, uh, you know, this kind of requires everything you're using, not only the, the dynamics, but the evaluation function and the certificate function. So F, V, and H all have to be polynomials for this to work, right? Because sum of squares programming is sort of predicated on doing polynomial optimizations. And another more, I'd say the more, uh, the, the, the bigger caveat, uh, because you can sort of approximate a lot of things with polynomials, but the bigger caveat is that uh, this only really works if the degree of the polynomials and the state dimension is not too large. And too large is kind of vague here, but really we sort of know that, you know, SDPs or semi-definite programming do not scale well in the number of decision variables. So for any non-trivial system, you either uh, need to do some very, very clever, uh, like, you know, dimensionality reduction, in order to actually get this SDP to solve, uh, or, or you need to use some SDP approximations, or really you just can't do it because you know it just doesn't scale well. So we want to sort of provide methods that can kind of really scale the high-dimensional systems, and this is why we're going to really just look at trajectory data. And so, right, the goal is going to be we're just going to limit ourselves to searching for V using only trajectory data, and we can do this uh, sort of uh, this by kind of having this relaxation. Um, it allows us to basically scale up these types of problems. And so we can sort of, you know, try to certify a much higher dimensional system. Okay, so that was a little bit of a digression about sum of squares programming. Uh, so now I can formulate what it means to actually use trajectory data, right? Because I think it's a little bit vague about that. And so remember we have this set of initial conditions X. Uh, we're gonna put a distribution over it and we're gonna use script D to denote this distribution. And the idea is that we're going to basically draw IAD samples of initial conditions from this distribution D, and then we're going to basically flow each one of these initial conditions uh, and to collect uh, M trajectories. So M here in, for the remainder of this talk is gonna denote the number of trajectories that we see. And uh, these Psi one to Psi M are gonna be the initial conditions. And so our observations are gonna be M uh, flows IAD from this distribution. And so what we're gonna do then is basically we're going to take our trajectories and we're gonna search for a certificate function that verifies the evaluation uh, inequality H less than zero along the trajectories we've seen so far, right? Um, and so, you know, that's effectively saying we're gonna solve this uh, feasibility problem of finding a function D such that, you know, when I sort of take uh, all of my initial conditions and, and all the, the points along the flow and evaluate H on them, uh, I'm going to get uh, something that's less than zero. And in fact, we're going to ask for something stronger. We're actually going to ask that to be less than negative gamma, where gamma is some margin. Uh, and we'll see the role that the margin is going to play in a moment. So we're going to basically form this empirical estimate that's going to give us an empirical estimate of what a certificate function is for the system. And supposing that this optimization problem is feasible, you know, let's let V hat of M denote this feasible solution. And the question we're gonna ask about this feasible solution is what is its generalization error? And by what do I mean by generalization error? So we're gonna define a generalization error as the probability of when I sort of draw a new uh, initial condition from this distribution D that the certificate condition is violated for any time along this trajectory, right? So uh, that's what this inner quantity here, this max of T and T of H greater than zero, uh, if that happens, that means that the certificate is invalid. And we're gonna basically ask what's the probability of that happening when we sample a point from this uh, initial condition from this distribution. So this is gonna be the key quantity that we study in this uh, portion of the talk, this generalization error. So uh, I wanna make sure that this is very clear uh, what the object of study is. So if there's any questions about the formulation here, the generalization error, now would be a sort of good time to, to clarify that before we kind of jump into analyzing this quantity here. So yeah, I would have a question actually. Do we know H at this point? Uh, sorry, you were a little bit uh, muffled. Um, oh, sorry. Do we know the function H at this point? Yeah, so uh, the H is kind of a design. So the, the way you think about this is like, 
I have a system and I think it's stable or I think it's invariant in this set, right? So uh, based on what I think it is, I'm gonna pick a function class V and then uh, whatever certificate I'm trying to evaluate that kind of describes what the H is as I sort of hinted at the previous slide, right? If, if for instance, if I want barrier, uh, the barrier inequality hold, I'm gonna ask that the lead derivative of V is greater than negative alpha of X, mm -hmm. right? And so that would basically tell me what the H is. So the H is kind of like, uh, it's my design choice. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to bound, we're basically the, 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 the first part of this talk is really about how do we bound this quantity, right? And so that's what we're gonna, we're gonna dig into right now. Um, right, and so in, in particular, the question we're gonna ask is we're gonna want a finite sample guarantee. So given an epsilon and a delta, right? We're gonna ask the question, how many trajectories M, which is gonna be a function of epsilon and delta, do we need such that the generalization error, this error of V hat of M is less than epsilon with probability at least one minus delta and the probability is taken over the initial conditions psi one to psi M, right? And so why is this a probabilistic quantity? Because the variable V hat of M is a function of you know, psi one to psi M. So it is itself a random quantity. And so its generalization error is actually a random quantity over the uh, data that we sort of saw in training. So this is a random variable. And so the random variable less than epsilon is something that's gonna only hold with some probability. And so we're going to want to basically fix the failure probability and then fix the epsilon and sort of ask, okay, how many trajectories do I need in order to, to make this assertion hold, right? Uh, and yeah, so this is, this is often in machine learning called a PAC or probably approximate correct style guarantee in that we can't actually ensure that this holds almost surely right, because uh, this is a probabilistic notion. So we can only sort of ensure that this holds up to some probability. Uh, but the nice thing is we're gonna be able to basically tune this probability. Uh, so once you sort of are saying, I'm able to live with a certain amount of failure, then we can kind of fix that delta and then give you a number of trajectories that you need in order, uh, uh, in order for this to be less than epsilon. Okay, so great. Uh, just to, to, to make this really clear what we're at, like how this might fit in a larger pipeline or framework. So think of like the existing things that you do in, in control as what is in this upper box called the existing pipeline where you take a system, you say solve some optimal control, uh, doing some fancy RL and that like gives you a policy pi. And so that's like, we're not modifying that part of the framework. What we're doing is that once you sort of do this and you close the loop, we're basically gonna take that closed loop, sample a bunch of trajectories and then solve this feasibility problem or this feasible optimization problem. And the output is going to be a, not only a certificate function, V hat of M, it's a typo here, this should be V hat of M, but also a probabilistic guarantee about the probability that the certificate is actually valid. So kind of this, this lower box here is really what this uh, work is all about. Okay, cool. So um, Nikolai talked, uh, I hope a lot about supervised learning in the beginning. Uh, lecture and there's a reason we did that and it's because this problem here is actually we're going to reduce it to an instance of supervised learning uh, from machine learning and actually basically steal all their theory uh, and just kind of apply it to this control problem uh, almost off the shelf. Uh, so this will be kind of a very nice reduction that we'll be able to use uh, for this type of problem. Okay and so I'm going to introduce this shorthand notation because it's very cumbersome to write h of you know the flow and the flow derivative and d and, and grad v. So we're gonna introduce this notation H of psi comma V, uh, which is basically going to evaluate the worst case H along the trajectory uh, for, the, for the certificate V, right? So basically, you know, that's what this quantity is here. And so, we, the, you know, you can kind of reduce the constraint of max of H less than zero to just saying H of psi V less than zero. And that's why we introduced the shorthand here. Okay. And, Right, so what we're gonna do now is basically define uh, two notions of risk. One is an empirical risk and one is a true notion of risk. Uh, and so for any V in the certificate class script V, uh, we can define this empirical risk, uh, R hat of gamma V. So remember, we actually had this uh, margin condition when we solved our empirical optimization problem. And we're gonna let that margin condition enter into the definition of the risk in the following way. So we'll define the empirical margin risk, r hat of d, to be 
1 over m, we're just going to sum over indicator functions of whether or not the ith constraint was met. So what do I mean by the ith constraint? I mean whether or not h of psi i of v was greater than minus gamma. So if the constraint is not met, uh, this 1 is going to trigger. And then if the constraint is met, this 1 will not trigger, or this indicator will not trigger. And so r hat of, v of gamma basically counts or averages the number of um, is like a frequency of the number of, uh, of, of constraint violations that um, this function, this certificate function V, uh, has on the data. Uh, meanwhile, RV, which we'll call the true risk, is the probability that when we draw a new sample uh, from this uh, distribution, that the uh, evaluation function H of uh, psi V is greater than zero. And so the idea is that, you know, in expectation, the empirical margin risk is a good estimator uh, for the true risk, right? And so, you know, if we minimize this empirical margin risk, which we do by finding solving that optimization problem, then that should hopefully give us a uh, solution that does a reasonable job of minimizing the true risk. Um, and so that's that's exactly kind of the idea of supervised learning that we talked about in the first lecture. Right. And so in particular, by definition of the fact that V hat of M is feasible, right, because V hat of M is, is exactly a solution such that H of psi V hat of M is less than minus uh, gamma for all psi. Uh, so by definition of feasibility, we actually have that the empirical margin risk is equal to zero because all constraints are satisfied. Right. This is like a almost a tautology here. I mean, this is a tautology, right? We kind of define the empirical risk in a way that uh, any like feasible solution is actually has zero empirical risk, right? So what we've done is basically minimize, quote unquote, minimize the empirical risk by finding a feasible solution. Uh, and so to proceed, like, you know, that's basically gets us half the way there. The only thing left to do now is we sort of need to upper bound uh, the true risk of V hat of M by some expression containing the empirical risk. And if we minimize the empirical risk, then we then have minimized that upper bound. And to do this, we're going to proceed with uh, uh, what Nikolai has hopefully did in the first talk, which is a, a type of uniform convergence argument that allows us to argue that the empirical risks converge uniformly over all V and script V uh, to the true risk at some rate, right? And so that's what we're going to proceed to do now. Are there any questions on the setup? So I have one question. So the this yes. H psi V function, so this consists of a maximization over T, which is a, like, do you assume that you can solve this maximization problem? Yeah, that's a good question. So for now, uh, because there's a continuous flow, for now, I'm going to just assume that, yes, you can solve this. But in practice, obviously, you don't do that. You kind of discretize at these points. Right? OK, yeah. and uh, is one dimensional, so is, you consider it as relatively simple? Yeah, yeah OK. Well. I mean, yes, it is a one dimensional optimization, but really in practice, you don't really fully maximize over, you know, literally the continuous interval. You just kind of discretize the flow because in a computer anyways, the flows are always discretized anyways, right? So then you just kind of look at your samples and then, and then it just becomes a, um, uh, then you can actually solve this problem. Uh, often what happens and the reason why you can do this is because often the parameterization you use for V is actually going to be say convex in the parameters and H kind of preserves that convexity. So mm -hmm. essentially you're kind of maximizing over a bunch of convex functions, which is also convex. So that's kind of why you can solve this in practice. Uh, but for the time being, when we're analyzing the theory, like we're just going to assume that you can do this and not even okay. talk about optimization complexity. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, yeah, let's dive into this uniform convergence argument. This will be our, basically we're going to like take a, a result from machine learning off the shelf and we're gonna to apply to this control problem. And, uh, and uh, hopefully I'll be very informative about like how you might sort of do this for different types of problems. All right, and so the result we're gonna use is a very nice result from uh, Natty Shrebro et al in 2010. And what that result says is that uh, basically it's going to study uniform convergence or what are called H smooth losses. And a smooth loss means that the has a Lipschitz gradient or equivalently the second derivative is bounded or the Hessian is bounded in operator norm, say, right? And so what this result is going to say uh, to, to sort of state this result, let me just briefly set up some notation for supervised learning. And in supervised learning, it often starts with a hypothesis class H or script H. Uh, 
uh, which is basically functions that map from set X to R. Uh, then we associate, uh, we also kind of pick a non-negative loss function, which is basically going to be a function C that takes two labels and then com computes the loss of these two labels and spits out a non-negative number. Uh, and then uh, supervised learning, typically we put a distribution over the pairs uh, X uh, cross R. And the idea is that, you know, basically we're going to sample ID elements from this distribution on X and R, and then we're defining these two uh, losses. So one is going to be the true loss, uh, or I probably should have called this risk. So maybe let's think of this as risk. Uh, loss and risk are usually kind of synonyms for each other. Uh, so the true loss is going to be the expected value over this distribution of the loss function of the hypothesis evaluated X uh, compared with the true label Y. And then the empirical loss is just uh, you know taking the average over uh, m empirical uh, IED samples from D of this loss. Okay, so that's the setting of supervised learning. So what does the theorem of Natty Shrebro at, at all say? So the theorem says the following: Suppose that the loss function is uniformly bounded. So this three soups here is just fancy notation for saying the loss function is uniformly bounded by B, uh, and that the loss uh, um, this phi of t is h smooth in the first argument uh, for every label. So we can we maybe would say it's uniformly h smooth uh, over all, all 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 y, right? And remember, this means that the second derivative is, is bounded uniformly. So suppose that these two conditions hold, and uh, these are not very restrictive conditions. We'll we'll kind of address this in a second. Uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to define this thing called a Rademacher complexity, this R of M of the hypothesis class H. And that's basically going to look at the worst case over the data, the expectation over these Rademacher uh, random variables, these epsilon i's. And remember, a Rademacher random variable is a, a variable, it's a scalar variable that has probability one half of being plus one and probability one half of being minus one. So it's just a random sign. Uh, and what we do is we take the expectation over these Rademacher random variables of the soup over H in script H of the empirical uh, average of the functions H of XI, uh, where we modulate each one of these uh, H of XI's with a Rademacher random variable, right? And so remember the idea was that the well, larger the Rademacher complexity, the richer the function class, because it means that the function class is essentially able to fit random labels. And the smaller the Rademacher complexity, the you know, smaller quote unquote the function class is. Uh, and so this is going to be the Rademacher complexity is essentially a key quantity that governs the rate of uniform convergence over a function class. So intuitively, you could expect the function classes are richer then the Rademacher complexities are richer, which means that the uniform convergence rates are going to slow down. And I'll show you in a second exactly how uh, this enters the picture. So and the, the, the way it enters the picture actually is going to be this next quantity gamma here, and it's going to be H times some log of m, which you can kind of ignore, uh, times the Rademacher complexity squared uh, plus b log 1 over delta over m. So roughly speaking, this gamma is of order 1 over m, right? And so what does the Natty's result say? It says that with probability at least 1 minus delta over the IID draws from this distribution d, then for every function h in my function class script h, so this is what uniform convergence means, uh, the true risk of h is upper bounded by the empirical risk of h uh, plus square root of the empirical risk of h times gamma plus gamma. And so the idea is that if the empirical risk is minimized to actually equal zero, then these first two terms are going to drop out. And what you're left with that is that the true risk of the empirical risk minimizer that achieves zero empirical risk is upper bounded by order one times gamma, which is approximately, you know, uh, say a constant uh, over M. So it gives you a one over M rate, which is called a fast, quote unquote, fast rate uh, in, in the statistical learning literature. Uh, sorry for so, interrupting. So, yes, go ahead. Uh, what, what, what does it mean by O1 here? Uh, sorry, yes, that's a kind of sloppy notation for an absolute constant. So meaning that like, you know, there's a number like say 25, right? Uh, but I just didn't really want to write 25 because it's not important. So I just say O1. Okay, so uh, just a constant, yeah. something. Yeah, like just that. like literally like twenty five. Okay. Every time you see oh one, you can put twenty five in there, and it will. Uh, okay, so honestly speaking, the constant is probably more like ten thousand, but I didn't want to say ten thousand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> got it. Thank <laughs> so, you. Yeah, uh, twenty five. Okay. Um, 
Right. And so what it's exactly saying is that the uh, right. So what the fast rate is saying is that the, the true risk of the empirical uh, minimizer, uh, the empirical risk minimizer is uh, a constant times gamma. And that's what Natty's result is saying. OK, so let's apply this um, to, to our problem of kind of verifying the certificates here. Right. And so the way that we do this, this so I'm going to kind of show a very standard reduction from going from uh, what that previous theorem is to kind of like a classification problem. Uh, so you may have seen something like this before, but I'm going to just go over this again because it's a very nice uh, reduction. And so the idea is that we basically define a smooth approximation of the indicator, uh, the zero one indicator loss. Right. And the smooth approximation is going to be parameterized by gamma margin gamma, and this is it's going to turn out this is exactly why we need a margin when we solve our optimization problem. Uh, and so what this, uh, there's a formula here, but the formula is really not that important. The, the, maybe the picture is the better story. So basically, um, the zero one loss, you know, is, is going to uh, be zero until we hit t is zero, and then it jump up to one, right? So this is a uh, discontinuous function. And what we do is we kind of approximate it with a smooth function that upper bounds the zero one loss. So you can see, you know, for any gamma greater than zero, uh, like any 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 one of these functions, and here I plotted, you know, four different values of gamma, but all of them upper bound to zero one loss, uh, and they do in a smooth way. Like this is basically a twice differentiable function uh, with bounded uh, second derivatives, and this is kind of why we define this with this weird cosine thing. It basically, kind of ramps up smoothly. Um, but something even more important than upper bounding zero one loss is that this function itself is actually upper bounded by a shifted indicator function. So uh, the first observation here, the first inequality says that uh, this smooth uh, hinge upper bounds the uh, hinge that's sort of centered at zero, but it itself is upper bounded by a, uh, sorry, not hinge, uh, indicator, but it itself is upper bounded by indicator that kind of starts at minus gamma. Right, and so basically, the pictorially, say we look at the red, the uh, indicator that upper bounds it, you know, is zero until point uh, five, and then jumps to one at negative point five, and then goes uh, to one, uh, is one the rest of the way. And so there's a sandwich relationship between the indicator that starts at zero and the indicator that starts at negative gamma. And so that's kind of why, uh, and, and this relationship is, is, is going to be useful for the, in the following way. So let's kind of use this relationship to our advantage. And the reason we're doing this is because to apply the, the theorem on the previous slide, we actually need a smooth loss, right? An H smooth loss. So this is exactly the H smooth loss that we're going to use. So with this uh, like relationship, we get two observations out of this. So the first observation is that the expectation of the indicator of H of psi v hat of m greater than zero is upper bounded by the expectation of phi of gamma of h, right? So that's just because of this first inequality here. And the second observation is that the empirical, uh, the empirical uh, phi loss, so one over m, when we sum over these phi of gamma h's, is upper bounded by the empirical uh, indicators uh, that are centered at uh, minus gamma, right? And so this, uh, Quantity here uh, on the right hand side of this inequality, of this last inequality, is exactly the, the empirical risk when we add this margin of minus gamma, right? And because we've minimized that empirical risk, we can now use this dominance condition here to say that we've minimized the empirical risk over these uh, smooth indicators. And so that's kind of what's going to be allow us to basically apply Natty's result, right? So Natty's result, Natty Srebo's result, applies to the left hand side of this inequality. But as long as we minimize something that dominates that left-hand side, then we can use it. And so that's, that's really the key idea here. And that's why we have this marching condition. So is this clear here? Right. Okay. I'll take that as a yes. And so let's do exactly what I said. <clears throat> So first of all, the generalization error of our certificate v hat of m is equal to the probability, by definition, the probability of h of psi of v hat of m greater than zero. And because it's a probability of some event, that's equal to the expectation of the indicator of that event. And then as we saw before, we're going to upper bound that by the smooth hinge loss with some gamma margin. Okay. And so uh, you can check uh, very easily that uh, this 
for a particular gamma, the smoothness constant here is actually pi squared over four uh, times gamma squared. The pi squared over four is really irrelevant. It's order one over gamma squared smooth. Okay. And so now if we define the Rademacher complexity of our uh, of the function class of the certificate class V is going to be taking uh, the expectation over these Rademacher random variables of the supremum of our function V in the certificate class script V of you know one over M, sum of I is one to M, epsilon I times H of psi I V, right? So this is going to be just uh, literally looking at naughty result and plugging in what the Rademacher complexity is. This is exactly what the definition that comes out uh, just by sort of like pattern matching with the, his, his, uh, his theorem. And so what Natty's result says is that the generalization error of our certificate is upper bounded by a constant times log three M over gamma squared times the Rademacher complexity squared plus a one over log, uh, sorry, a log one over delta over M term, right? And so this whole quantity here, uh, we will see that the Rademacher complexity itself scales like one over square root M. So the square of the Rademacher complexity scales like one over M. So what this says is that this error, this generalization error, it's actually going to scale something like one over M and it's going to be modulated by a one over gamma squared. And also extra terms are going to appear in the numerator that kind of come from the Rademacher complexity. But roughly speaking, the result is like a one over M type of uh, convergence. So if, if you want this thing to be less than epsilon, you need roughly, you know, one over epsilon samples. It's kind of the takeaway from this result. Okay. And so, Kind of the, the the remainder of the game is to like how do we bound this like ugly looking quantity here this Rademacher complexity. So really, once we can get a handle on this Rademacher complexity, then basically the 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 Srebro et al's result does most of the heavy lifting, and now we have a bound on the generalization error of our certificate. So then any questions on, on this reduction here? So the re remainder of this part of this of this first part of this talk, I'm going to basically talk about how we bound this Rademacher complexity, but it's important to kind of understand why we're doing that. And and uh, so, if there's any questions on like why this Rademacher complexity, you know, uh, so that it would be a good time to ask now. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, right. So as I said, the remains to bound this uh, Rademacher complexity term. So let's 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 do that. Okay. So the main tool is going to be Dudley's inequality, which uh, Nikolai talked about in the first part of the talk. And I'll remind us when we get there what Dudley's inequality actually does. Um, but in order to use Dudley's inequality, kind of in order to get us to a point where we can kind of apply these off the shelf tools, we're gonna need to bring in some notions of stability. Uh, luckily, we'll actually be able to get away with kind of a very weak notion of stability. Uh, and the assumption that we're gonna kind of assume this uh, stability in the sense of Lyapunov type condition, uh, which says that there exists a uh, set S that's bounded, say compact, uh, such that when, like, if I flow my initial conditions X through all time, uh, I remain within this set S. All right, so basically this says that if I start in some, if I start from initial, some initial condition in X, I'm never going to leave the set S. I probably should have drew a picture here, uh, but for all time, I'm never going to leave this set S. And that set S is bounded, and that's the, the assumption that we need. Okay, uh, and secondly, we also kind of want some regularity on our certificate class. This is kind of a less of a, a stringent um, requirement. Really, it just says like uh, I can uniformly bound the certificate V over not only of over all my certificates, but over all, every element in the state space S. Uh, I just some uniform bound B of V. And furthermore, the same thing applies to the gradient. So the gradient uh, is going to be uniformly bounded uh, over uh, some. Uh, uh, over all the certificates, over all the compact set. So like, this is really not a big deal. If S is compact and V is like parameterized continuously, then, uh, then uh, and as long as like the, the uh, size of the parameters of V is bounded, like this will always hold. Uh, so um, this is just, I'm calling out these constants so that we don't have to like, you know, just, we just need to give them a name, but yeah. So the second assumption is really not a big deal. It's really the first assumption that says like, I'm stable in the sense of Lyapunov. But if I'm trying to come up with a cert stability certificate, I believe a system is actually stable, for instance, then it's really not that unreasonable to believe that it's stable in the sense of Lyapunov. Uh, so maybe this also isn't that stringent of a, of a type of assumption. Okay. So 
so let's kind of take those two assumptions and see what we can do with these. And so the third kind of quantity we're going to need is uh, an upper bound for a Lipschitz constant. So we'll call LH. Uh, we'll let LH be a Lipschitz constant for the following function. Uh, we're going to basically take our H function and we're going to take two arguments to it, V and grad V. And we're, and we're going to compute the Lipschitz constant holding x and x fixed. So, we're, so you know, this is a function of two arguments. It's parameterized by x. Uh, it's going to have some Lipschitz constant v of uh, l of h. And we're going to ask that this l of h holds uniformly for all, l, all x in the, in, the, in the compact set. OK. Uh, and we're going to define this following norm on the function class. Uh, uh, script V. And this norm is just going to look, it's like a kind of a supremum norm, but it's going to look at the supremum of both the function value and its gradient. Uh, and then it'll just kind of just sort of treat the function value and its gradient as a concatenated vector, and we'll just take the norm of that in L2 set. And we'll, we'll use that to define a norm on the function class. And we'll see why we kind of want both V and grad V in a second. All right. And so I mean, okay, so this is why. So the claim is that um, for any initial condition and for any pair of functions v1 and v2 in this function class, we have this Lipschitz type continuity that says of h of psi of v1 minus h of psi v2, it's gonna be upper bounded by this Lipschitz constant times v1 minus v2 in this script v norm that I defined it up, uh, up above. And so, this is basically saying that like, this is kind of how we're gonna use Dudley's inequality, right? Once we have some sort of Lipschitz continuity type assumption, then we can kind of plug into Dudley's and, and go from there. So that's exactly the goal here. And so the proof of this is very simple. Uh, maybe I'll just um, kind of highlight how you might do this. Uh, it's quite elementary, but the point is that the only difficulty here is that H is defined by a maximum. Remember, H is like, I'm gonna take the maximum violation over this entire flow. Right, and so what we just need to do is kind of define of h sub t, which is the h at the point t, and then we just kind of let ti be the maximizing value uh, for for i is one to two, right? Such that h of psi vi is equal to h of ti psi vi. And once you have those two definitions, then it's effectively just triangle inequality, and the fact that uh, h of t one is um, suboptimal for h for for uh, t two, like the time that optimizes uh, v1 is going to be suboptimal for the time that optimizes v2. So once you kind of chain that fact together with the triangle inequality, uh, you basically get uh, exactly the, 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 the Lipschitz condition I claimed. Um, so uh, yeah, so, uh, the, so this is kind of a, this is an elementary observation. And um, you can kind of switch the roles of v1 and v2 here. And so that basically kind of yields this claim that this h is Lipschitz. Uh, so I'm going to kind of not go into the details here. Uh, I'll send these slides out uh, if you can read these in, in more detail. If you're curious, but really, like, so this is we're just going to take this claim uh, uh, as given. Right. OK, so now we can kind of jump into how we might actually apply Dudley's inequality here. So what does Dudley's inequality say? Uh, so basically, in this context, it's saying that the Rademacher complexity of V is going to be upper bounded by uh, constant 24 here. Uh, which uh, I think Nikolai might have wrote 16. Uh, the constant is really, again, not that relevant. Uh, our different books have different constants. Uh, but so, okay, so we'll say order one VL of H over square root M times the integral from zero to infinity of square root of the covering number of the function class V in the norm script V that I defined. So remember what a covering number is, is basically, you know, I have some object or some set V, which in this case is a set of functions. And the covering number is basically saying, what's the minimum amount of elements from V I need so that I can cover the space? And by cover means that for every point in the space, there must exist a point in my cover that is no farther than epsilon away. And the way we're gonna measure the distance is with this norm this, uh, that I defined, this norm script V, right? So Dudley's inequality basically says, if I can upper bound the covering number of the, the, the sort of the function class I care about, then that gives me a way of computing the Rademacher complexity because I just integrate the square root of the log covering number. And uh, I think Nikolai worked through an example of this in the, in the lecture earlier this morning, and we're gonna go through a few more examples of this uh, now. Okay, so that's, uh, so this is kind of a very general like formula that we're gonna use. 
but to further specialize this bound, we need to kind of specialize the function class. Uh, we need to kind of open up the function class so that we can get a quantity that's more specific than this. But before I do that, I want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page uh, and like we know like what we're trying to accomplish right now and what and uh, so if there's any questions, please uh, do ask. Okay, so now we're going to jump in and we're going to uh, bound the rod marker complexity for two different types of function classes. Um, so the first function class is we're going to say our certificates V uh, look like uh, V of theta of X is equal to G of X comma theta, where theta is going to be, so theta is going to parameterize our certificate functions. It's itself going to be a, a K dimensional vector uh, in Euclidean space. And its L2 norm is going to be less than B theta, right? And this function G is going to be a, a C1 function uh, because we also want the certificate to be differentiable. Okay, so that's our function class. This is a very, very general function class, right? It just says like, okay, it's some nonlinear parametric function class has K parameters and the norm of those parameters are bounded. And, and that, that parameterized and this like G thing is differentiable. But other than that, there's no assumptions. It's very general. Um, function class. So for instance, it could capture like a neural network uh, with differential exacerbations. Uh, okay. So we're going to define some more Lipschitz constants because we're trying to use Dudley's inequality. So we'll let LG be the Lipschitz constant of, uh, of um, this G function where we're holding X fixed. So it's going to be a function, it's a Lipschitz of theta maps to GX theta. Uh, and Similarly, L grad G is going to be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient of G, uh, and where the gradient is actually going to be evaluated with respect to X. So this is effectively the Lipschitz constant of grad D, right? Uh, because uh, you, you differentiate the Lyapunov function or the certificate function with respect to the state, right? And that's why we're taking the gradient with respect to X here, okay? And so the claim is that the Rademacher complexity of this particular function class is upper bounded by a constant times B theta LH LG plus L grad G. So these are kind of the Lipschitz constants of the problem and the size of the function class in terms of the L2 norm times the square root of the number of parameters W or K over uh, the number of uh, samples M, right? And so that's a claim. So how do we get to this? Well, we basically uh, use that. Um, okay, so what do we do here is we basically uh, use the fact that uh, the norm of V1 minus V2 in the script V norm, uh, which is equal to this by definition, um, is going to be upper bounded by the, I mean, effectively it's going to be Lipschitz in the parameters. So with some Lipschitz constant here. So basically, uh, because we have this Lipschitz uh, in the parameters theta, then we can change the covering number of V uh, to be a covering number over the LK ball. LK ball like the k-dimensional ball in L2, right? And so effectively, we take Dudley's, we basically plug in these Lipschitz constants out here that allows us to change to using the covering number over the L2 ball in k-dimension. And we know that the covering number of the L2 ball in k-dimension is upper bounded by one plus two over epsilon to the k. Uh, that's this volume comparison argument that Nikolai talked about in the morning. And so then all we have to do is integrate zero to one square root of log one plus two over epsilon uh, the epsilon, and uh, that's uh, something we can just do in Mathematica, and so that's kind of where all this, this drops out, or right, so this kind of all simplifies, and that's why we get square root k over m. So the square root k really comes from the fact that, like, the covering number is exponential in k, so when we take the log of that, we basically pick up the k linearly, and then the log lives under the square root, and that's, so that's kind of why we get a square root k. Okay, and that's the, that's, that's it. So basically, we bounded the Rademacher complexity uh, for this very general function class. So any questions here? Okay, so cool. So now I'm gonna do something that I think is, is kind of interesting. Uh, I'm gonna add some more structure to V. And uh, by doing this, we're actually going to see a place where we can actually do something more sophisticated uh, to get a better Rademacher complexity bound, right? And so what we're going to do is kind of um, use this idea from sum of squares. Uh, 
And so oftentimes we want our certificate functions to actually be positive. And one way of enforcing positivity or say non-negativity is to write our functions as, you know, essentially a sum of squares or, you know, something that's like feature map transpose times a positive semi-definite matrix times a feature map, right? And so if I have this feature map psi here and I, I sort of look at a function class that's parameterized by positive definite or positive semi-definite matrices Q, um, this is a you know a very natural way of sort of representing positive functions that I can optimize over, right? So here the feature map is fixed. You only optimize over the parameters Q. Now, if we use a previous analysis, right? The previous analysis says that if I have K parameters, the raw marker complexity scales like square root K over M. But in this case, I actually have P times P or, or P squared parameters, or say P, P plus one over two, because it's symmetric. But say we have order P, par P squared parameters, right? So we kind of plug that into our previous bounds. We would actually get a raw marker complexity that's P over square root M, right? And that seems kind of odd, right? That's like, that's not, that's not great, right? Why are we paying P squared, basically? We should be only like, is there a way we can kind of pay linearly or in P? Um, so the claim is that we can actually do that. We can actually improve this from P squared to P times log squared P. Uh, so that we're paying, you know, p log p or p log squared p instead of p squared. Okay, and uh, it's not obvious that you can do this, but uh, I'm going to show you how you can do this using some very cool uh, tools. Um, okay, so the first step we're going to do is kind of with all these problems, we kind of have to define these like uniform bound constants. So here I'm just saying that the feature map and its gradient are sort of bounded over S. Again, if S is compact and everything's continuous, this is just these are just constants that are finite. We just need to give them a name. So let's just give them a name. And uh, we can see that the gradient of V is just two times, you know, the derivative of psi transpose times Q times psi, right? That's just by definition of this function class. Okay. And kind of by writing it like this, it's not hard to check. Uh, just by some simple algebra that the the um, V1 minus V2 in the script V norm is going to be Lipschitz in the parameters Q. But the important thing is that the Lipschitz is in the operator norm of the matrices, not the Frobenius norm. So if we like, I mean, obviously operator norm is upper bounded by the Frobenius norm. So it is also Lipschitz in the Frobenius norm, but by sort of exposing ourselves to this matrix structure, we're actually able to improve the norm, right? So we can actually say it's Lipschitz with respect to the operator norm. And, let's, and this will turn out to be actually very important. Um, so let's see why this is important. So once we have this type of thing, then Dudley's inequality sort of says that the covering number we care about is going to be the covering number of, of um, the Frobenius norm ball of matrices, of P by P matrices, but we're going to cover them not with the Frobenius norm, but we're going to cover them with respect to the operator norm. And that's exactly where this win is going to come from. Um, so Right, it's the mismatch of norms between the ball in the Frobenius norm and the norm that we're measuring the ball or the covering in the operator norm that allows us to actually reduce dimensionality from P squared to P. And the reason we can do this is because first of all, we can trivially upper bound the covering number in the operator norm by the covering number in the Frobenius norm because of the relationship that the operator norm is always uh, dominated by the Frobenius norm, right? And so, if we kind of use the trivial bound from before, that's exactly where we get this p squared because the uh, covering, the law covering number of, uh, you know, the p by p ma matrices in a Frobenius norm, you can basically treat that as a vector by, you know, you just kind of squash the matrix into a vector and it's going to be a vector of length p squared. And so that's why it's p squared log one plus two over epsilon. Right? So that's, that's quote unquote the trivial bound. But what's really cool is that uh, there's this uh, inequality in, in, in like geometric functional analysis called the dual Sudikov inequality, which actually allows us to improve the dependence on P by uh, eating a worse expense, uh, a dependence in the, 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 the covering resolution epsilon. So in particular, what, this, what we have is that the log covering number of the matrices, uh, the Frobenius ball of matrices in the operating norm is actually upper bounded by P over epsilon squared times a universal constant C. So you can see here that the, the, the dependence on P uh, goes from P squared to P, but the dependence on epsilon is worse because it's you know log one over epsilon to one, uh, one over epsilon squared, right? But the important thing is that both of these inequalities are valid. So we can basically take the minimum over both of these 
right? And so for small epsilon, when epsilon is really close to zero, we're going to want to use the first one, right? Because we don't, otherwise, you know, the epsilon would sort of start to blow up a, in, in a polynomial way. But when we're far enough away, epsilon is greater than zero, we can actually switch over to the second one. And this is why Dudley's inequality is very important because Dudley allows us to integrate over these resolutions, right? And so in particular, if we integrate from zero one over all epsilon from zero one, we can split this integral up into the first part where we kind of look at, you know, where we, we pick up, we're gonna pick a resolution tau, and then we're gonna split the integral up so that in the first part, we actually use the trivial covering number. And in the second part, when we're sufficiently far away from epsilon greater than zero, we can actually use the more sophisticated covering number that allows us to reduce the dimensionality. And so in particular, if we take this integral here from Dudley, right? So we pick this tau by using the first inequality, that's kind of why we can, uh, why we can sort of bound this by uh, um, P times integral square root log one plus two over epsilon. And then when, for, for all epsilon greater than tau, we're gonna use the second inequality. So then we actually get square root P times the integral from tau to one of one over epsilon d epsilon, right? And so that we recognize is just basically, so that, so basically we can, inter, in the third, in the second inequality, we basically just evaluated the second integral explicitly. And so you can see, we basically get something like P times integral from zero to tau plus square root P. And now the trick is gonna be, we're gonna pick tau small enough so that we can kind of cancel out one of these P terms here. And so that the overall sum is of order square root P. Uh, okay, so let's do that. Uh, it's, um, it's a little bit of a, a, a annoying to do, but it's uh, you can just kind of take Mathematica, plug this integral in. And if you do this, you'll get some expression here, which uh, I would have not gone by myself, but uh, basically Mathematica says that this is, uh, you know, tau square root log three over tau plus some constant times the error complementary function square root log three over tau. Okay, uh, that's kind of unwieldy, but luckily there's a nice inequality that says that earth C is upper bounded by e to the minus x squared. Uh, for all x greater than zero, so we can plug that inequality in, and lo and behold, uh, we actually get basically something that scales like tau square root log one over tau. And so then the magic then is that we just pick tau to be one over square root p, right? And then that basically makes this the whole quantity order p, uh, order square root p times log p. And that's kind of why we're getting this extra log factors is because of the splitting uh, of uh, this uh, uh, Dudley inequality. Uh, so whether or not log p here is optimal, I don't know. Uh, this, I just uh, picked something that made it, you know, not p squared. Maybe you can improve this square root p log p where the log is under the square root. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of this. Uh, this is a kind of a nice calculation here. Um, and so you combine this together, you basically get that the Ramacher complexity is scaling like uh, square root p log square p over m. Uh, are there any questions here? So at a high level, basically, we, we, we did a naive bound where we kind of just treated all the parameters with no structure, and then we got a square root k over m. But then we then actually opened up that structure and said, well, if we actually have this, you know, psi transpose q psi, where q is a matrix, we can actually, like, take advantage of this matrix structure and improve our Rademacher complexity from p squared to p, log p. Okay, so that's that. Um, so now that we have bounded these raw micro complexities in these two cases, we can actually get these end-to-end uh, -end generalization bounds. So we're basically gonna plug this raw micro complexity back into the, the Schriebro et al. result that we saw earlier. And so, so just as a reminder, if our function class is this uh, general K parameter uh, function class, then the generalization error of V hat of M is gonna be basically K log three M over M times these constants out in front. And on the other hand, if we have this like sum of squares type uh, uh, parameterization where it's phi transpose Q phi, uh, then we basically get that the generalization error is like P log squared P, uh, which is coming from the Ronmacher stuff times log cubed uh, M over M. And so that's kind of uh, the first part of this talk. Um, what time is it now? Uh, I think uh, this is actually be a good place to stop for a break. Uh, or, or yeah, so maybe we'll take a five minute break here and I'll leave the slide up and we can think about um, just yeah, if there's any questions here. So let's take a, let's take a five minute break uh, and uh, we'll resume back at, uh, what is it, 8.05 there? <laughs> 
Yep, that's perfect. Okay. So maybe I can ask a question to uh, yeah. break the ice a bit. So what would you suggest if, if a variety of the, the Lipschitz assumptions, if you, if you cannot satisfy them? So they show up in a, in a variety of locations, also in, in the part of, of Nikolai, but should you then go for more local analysis or do something completely different? What, what was your suggestion? Uh, so you're asking like if, uh, if we can't bound, <clears throat> I guess the question is, what do you mean by can't satisfy as in like, um, yeah, if, if it just, if, you if don't you, know a good bound or you just, uh, or you actually aren't like smooth you feel enough it's too strong, you, right? If you don't, uh, you feel this, this the function class, you just really assuming a Lipschitz continuity is too strong, then what should you do? Like, is there any hope to then still do something? Uh, I mean, I think it really depends on like, uh, um, the function like yeah if this doesn't hold it, you may be but like it really depends on the situation you're in like without knowing your specific situation uh it's hard to say right because then the problem is that if you can't really use this dudley type inequality um then you have to kind of use something else and the something else is going to be very much dependent on exactly what your situation is so uh it is kind of hard to say without knowing the specifics unfortunately uh um, yeah. But having said that, like basically all the in all the situations that I proposed, right? Because everything is sort of compact, and as long as everything is sort of continuous, you these delicious constants will exist. Yeah. It's just that like maybe you don't have a good bound on them. Like maybe the bound you come up with on them is is very bad, right? But they will actually exist in all the situations I I've sort of looked at already. Um, if they don't exist, it's probably because like your 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 dynamics themselves are not you know like stable enough, right? So I think maybe the the question is like what happens if like the dynamics are actually like not stable in a way that I can actually use any of this stuff, right? And I think that's actually very much an uh, interesting question. I think it actually still kind of open about like how would you basically certify instability? Like how would you prove something is unstable? Right. In that case, then it's actually much more unreasonable to like ask for all these Lipschitz constants to exist because maybe your, you know, maybe your stuff's actually just going off to infinity, and then yeah, maybe there is no Lipschitz constant. Uh, but I think that's actually still a very much open question. So. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to actually, uh, so what's interesting is that um, there are actually some nice approaches in the uh, literature uh, that actually kind of address very similar problems as what I propose, and they do it in a very different way. So I kind of want to go over some just to, so you're aware of like what's, what are like the related approaches to kind of getting generalization bounds from uh, these types of uh, um, um, uh, optimization problems. So one approach, and you may, you, some of you may have seen this before, it's very, very elegant. It's like a very beautiful uh, work. It's this idea of random convex program. And a random convex program um, is basically the problem. So like, uh, so this is a result due to Calafiori uh, in 2010. It's a very beautiful uh, paper. And so suppose that um, the function h is actually convex in the parameterization of, of theta, meaning that like, I have some function class v of theta, right? Or some, some functions v theta. And suppose that like after I stick it in my certificate inequality, it's actually convex in this argument. And I'll show you an example when this happens later, right? Then this feasibility problem that I was proposing we solve to find a certificate on the data is actually what's called a random convex program. Like it's a convex optimization program, uh, but it's also a random variable, right? Like the solution that comes out is random because it depends on these initial conditions. And so Cali Fiore has this very nice theorem that says like, okay, if you solve this random convex program and it's feasible, and so you take the feasible solution, uh, you can basically bound the generalization error less than epsilon by this formula. And there's, so there's this formula that says like, uh, you know, this beta of epsilon, there's, there's some formula here, uh, the details are not that important, but it basically says that if I pick any epsilon with probability one minus beta epsilon, uh, my generalization error is less than epsilon, right? So this is like the exact same question we are after. Uh, it makes a stronger assumption that there's this convex parameterization, but it, A, it doesn't need this margin here. So that's kind of cool. And B, uh, 
numerically, it will turn out that this bound is actually much sharper than any uniform convergence bound will ever give you. So let me kind of show you that a little bit. Uh, so in order to compare this bound with the one that we de derived, you, you need to invert this B of epsilon, beta epsilon equals delta. Uh, you can't do this numerically. You can't do this uh, analytically. You can do it numerically, uh, but you can't do it analytically. But you can use a turnoff inequality. And the details of this are actually laid out in the Kelly Fiore paper. Uh, and, but the turnoff inequality basically will say something like, so once you use that, it says that the generalization error v of error of v hat of m is less than a constant here times k minus one plus log one over delta over m, uh, which is very, very, very similar to what we derived, right? Order wise, it's actually the same, except for a, there's no Lipschitz constants, b, you don't need a margin, and uh, c, uh, it will turn out that this constant and in, in, even better, the numerical formula is much sharper uh, than, than what I just previously derived. Um, so it's cool that we're able to kind of recover a result like this with much more general uh, function classes, but we did have to make a lot more assumptions, you know, like this uh, Lipschitz constant type assumptions, and our formula is not as useful numerically. Uh, but so if you are actually in a convex situation where everything is convex, uh, this is like a much better bound to use. Uh, it's very cool stuff. Okay. Um, and so when, when are you in a convex situation? So let's, let me give you an example. Let's say we're looking for Lyapunov stability. So our H is grad V, V uh, inner product would be dot or X dot plus rho times V. Uh, suppose that we use that uh, parametric representation that like sum of squares representation where it's phi of transpose Q phi. Then if you just plug this formula in here, you actually see that this H is linear in the parameters Q, right? So it's not linear in like X, right? But that doesn't matter because that's actually like X is coming from the, the, ran, the data, right? So it's like fixed. What's important is that this K, Q H function is linear and hence convex in Q. Uh, this actually answers the earlier question too about like how do you optimize over um, this, the, like the interval. Well, if it's like, if it's linear in this basically, in Q, you can kind of like move everything around so that you're really optimizing the maximum over like the trajectory, uh, you know, basically be a maximum over these like derivatives. Um, so that's just a, a kind of a random aside. But yeah, so the point is that like this parameterization is actually linear in Q, so you can actually directly apply uh, the, the RCP result. Now, having said that, if you directly apply the RCP result, you will actually be K squared over, it'll be like P squared over M instead of p log p over m that we derive. But the constants will be much better. So it's like, okay, like probably still this bound will give you a better numerical, uh, the RCP bound will probably give you a new better, better numerical bound, but you know, asymptotically, the bound that we derive will actually be sharper as p goes to infinity. Um, but anyway, that's a random aside. Okay, so uh, second thing is that if you really care about this number, like let's say you don't care about the scaling, like you're a very practical person, you you could not care less if it's like you know k over m, k squared over m, whatever. You just want a number like 0.5, right? Then this is not the way to do it. So the way to do it, if you actually just only care about a number, uh, is um, okay. So so before I jump to that, right? So I'm gonna okay. So I'm gonna kind of outline the like, we're gonna go from like worst to best in terms of constants, right? So uh, well, actually, I don't even think that word is right. So I'm just going to talk about three things to do that, that exist in the literature, and then I'll show you what you should actually do. So first thing is uniform convergence. As I said before, the constants are not practical. Second thing is randomized convex programs. Uh, these can actually give some nice bounds, but they're only applicable to convex optimization problems. Uh, there's actually a third line of work that you, you all may have seen, which is called pack phase inequalities. Uh, this originated with McAllister's paper in 1999, but recently, uh, Dan Roy uh, um, from Toronto and uh, Ani Majumdar from Princeton have actually used pack phase inequalities to give like non-vacuous generalization bounds for deep learning. So they're able to actually use pack phase to like compute a number that is like the generalization error of this deep neural network and it's less than one, right? And, and which you will never get from like uh, uniform convergence type uh, arguments. So that's cool, right? Uh, but um, uh, using like using these in practice is actually kind of complicated because you have to like jointly train the prior. Uh, sorry, like, you, like there's a this is like a very complicated optimization problem uh, to solve, uh, and they kind of go into a little bit of work kind of about how you can do that. But really, still, if that's if you just care about the number, it's still not the right way to do this. So the right way to do this is 
uh, there's a very nice paper from John Langford in 2005 about like practical uh, theory, classification theory for machine learning. And in it, he basically gives you a very powerful result, which is I, I'll call it the holdout method. So the holdout method basically says, okay, so suppose I want to estimate a generalization error of like uh, um, something I train. So what you do is then you, you take your data, you split it into a training set and a holdout set, right? And you compute the, all, all the stuff you want to do on the training set. So you can do like whatever you want to do, any deep learning, any whatever. And then what you do then is you then basically take and you compute an empirical estimate of your learned model on the holdout set by just computing, you know, uh, since the holdout was not used in training, this actually gives you an unbiased estimate of their generalization error. So you can just count the number of violations on the holdout set, right? And then what you do is then you basically use a sharp turnoff inequality that uh, takes this p hat and computes an upper confidence bound on the p hat, uh, given that's a function of the number of samples you use and hold out and like the probability of failure. So for instance, you could set mh to be 0.1 times the, number, the amount of data you get, uh, or 0.05 or whatever, right? And you can set, so, so the point is that you can numerically get an upper confidence bound on your uh, uh, generalization error this way. And if you use this procedure, like I guarantee you, you'll be sharper than like any sort of stat learning bound or pack based bound or anything like that. Like this is really the right way to estimate these type of quantities. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's a, um, a nice thing to know. Okay, any questions about this? So may, maybe I can make a comment. So the, this yeah. random convex program. So we will have on Tuesday, like one of the pioneers there, like Marco Campi is one of the speaker on Tuesday. So mm -hmm. to the audience, I guess you will hear like in-depth insights for over random convex programs and the connection to chance constraint programs on Tuesday. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool stuff. And it's very interesting that like the proofs in that paper, they look different from the types of proofs that I did. So they really exploit the structure of like, what it means to be feasible for this optimization problem and like what a feasible, like what are the properties of feasible solutions? So they kind of really dig into it and that's why you can get much sharper type of, of, uh, of results. So I'm glad that uh, Campy is speaking. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit. Um, this part, so we kind of focus a lot about like generalization bounds. But at the end of the day, you might argue like, well, maybe I really want a deterministic guarantee. Like I don't want, I don't really care about like the probability of drawing from this uh, initial uh, tr initial condition. I really want to know like what part of the state space, you know, can I initialize my robot in and that it will work. Like I don't want some probability to it. I just want to know like where, what are the parts of my state space that are safe and what are the parts that are not safe, right? Like at the end of the day, that's probably what we care about more. Um, so the question that I want to ask is like, can we convert this probabilistic bound into a deterministic bound, right? So if I tell you that the probability is small when I draw from a, a, a violating the, the certificate from a, if, if, if you know the probability is small when you draw a random condition, then intuitively you would believe that like a large part of the state space must be safe, right? But like, how do you sort of make that connection formal? So that's kind of what we're going to dig into a little bit. Um, Right, and I actually think these are, this is kind of a very uh, interesting question. I don't propose to have a very good solution. I just think this is a solution. So I'm curious to hear about your comments uh, after I sort of talk about the solution here, right? And so there's going to be an auxiliary technical question that I'm going to use that is going to be our main tool to addressing this question. And so I'm gonna propose a, like a seemingly unrelated auxiliary technical question. We'll solve it, it's actually very simple. And then we will then actually use it to get a deterministic guarantee uh, about our certificate, right? So bear with me for a moment while we, we talk about this somewhat arbitrary technical question. And so the question is as follows. Uh, we're gonna let mu of leb, let's we'll just call this a Lebesgue measure. This will be a Lebesgue measure on Rn. And we're gonna fix some compact set X that's gonna have positive Lebesgue measure, okay? And I'm gonna let mu of X be the uniform measure over the set. So meaning that like the probability of any subset of X is gonna be uh, uh, 
given assigned a probability that's going to be uh, the ratio of the Lebesgue measure of A to the ratio to the Lebesgue measure of X, right? Uh, and so the question is as follows: If I tell you that I have a set U contained within X uh, that has uh, mu of, has measure mu of X less than epsilon, right? So the probability of of it occurring when I sort of draw from the random measure on X, the uniform measure on X is less than epsilon. Uh, uh, what's the largest ball, like L2 ball, I can fit within that set? Okay. So uh, mathematically, there's a, a there's some formula we can write, but pictorially, I think is better. Pictorially says I have some set X with measure X uh, less than epsilon, and um, sorry, this actually be some set U. So the set U as has has a, like uniform measure less than epsilon. What's the largest ball I can shove inside? Right. Okay, and so the answer to this question seems like kind of hard, uh, but it's actually remarkably simple. Uh, so I'm gonna claim that the largest ball you can fit in is uh, um, going to be basically epsilon to the one over N times the ratio of the Lebesgue measure of X over the Lebesgue measure of a, of a radius one ball um, to the nth power. Okay, and the way to see this is that uh, if I have a ball that fits in with my set U, Right, so for any x r such that I can con contain myself within the set u, then the Lebesgue measure of u is true is greater than the Lebesgue measure of this ball by this containment relationship. Right, this is just the monotonicity of measure property, and then I'm going to use translation invariance of the Lebesgue measure to basically shift the measure of the ball at, from x to the origin. Right, and that's just because Lebesgue measure of translation invariance. And then I'm going to use this like pull out property of Lebesgue measure where I can pull the radius out and eat uh, with, but, but scale it to a, a power n, right? So the, the measure of the radius, uh, a ball radius r is equal to the r to the n times the measure of a ball radius one. Okay, so now once I do that, then since I know that the, the uniform measure of my set u is less than epsilon, then by definition of the uniform measure, this means that the Lebesgue measure of u is less than epsilon times the Lebesgue measure of x, right? And so I just chain these equalities together and now I can solve for r and that gives me my claim. Uh, so this, uh, this idea is due to Max Simschewitz. Uh, I, I asked him how you would do this and this is what he came up with. Very, I think this is very cute. Uh, so give Max credit for this. Okay, so let's use this technical lemma in a way. And so the idea is basically going to be as follows, right? Like the, the idea maybe is hopefully is, is somewhat clear at this point in that uh, if we know that the probability when I draw a random element from this trajectory is small, then like let's just kind of make it life simple and assume that my measure over the set X is actually uniform. Then what this basically says is that the set of violations is a measure of a set less than epsilon where epsilon is a generalization error, right? And if what that means then is that I can use this lemma to sort of ask what's the largest ball I can fit within my bad set. And that sort of tells me like what's the, you know, what's the, where and this, like that, that kind of bounds like the worst case in the state, this parts of the state space where my inequalities are violated. So that's, that's the idea of the proof that we're going to dig into next. So let's, let's dig into that a little bit. So we're going to basically um, suppose that I hand you a certificate function B. And uh, the suppose that V is satisfies the lower bound V is greater than it's, you know, minorized by the Euclidean norm squared, because uh, I'm, I'm, let's say we're looking at exponential stability for now. Then the bad set XB is going to be the set of all initial conditions X, such that there exists a time in the flow that I violate my certificate. And because we're looking at exponential stability, that means that there's going to exist a time in the flow such that the lead derivative is greater than negative lambda times b, right? Because my condition is that the lead derivative is always less than equal to negative lambda v, right? So this is the bad set, sort of the sets where, you know, I don't have what I want. So assume that the uniform measure over x of this set x, the bad set, is less than epsilon. And as I mentioned before, if the distribution over x is actually uniform, then this uniform measure over S, X is exactly equal to the generalization error that we sort of bounded on the first part of this talk. The first, first part of the first section of this talk. Okay, and so that's where such a bound would come from. 
So now the question is, for which x in s, remember s is like where the, the states can flow to, can we assert based on these assumptions that the, uh, the, the v derivative is going to be less than, uh, I'm sorry, this is a little typo here. It's really short. For which x in s can we assert that, ignore the max, that grad v of x comma f is less than negative lambda v of x? There's no max in t here. OK. So that's the question we're going to ask. And to make this, uh, the, we're going to add one more assumption here to make this happen. And we're going to now use incremental stability. And so incremental stability is this idea that I'm going to assume that uh, I have this class KL function beta such that if I start any two points in x and I flow, these trajectories are going to converge to each other as time goes to infinity. And kind of the worst case deviation between these two trajectories is going to be governed by like the beginning condition. Um, yeah, so basically it just says that any pairs of trajectories are going to eventually converge towards each other. And this will be a, a key tool that we're going to use to, to answer this question for which X and S can we assert that the lead derivative is actually certified by V. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to define uh, the set tilde x delta for, we're going to fix a delta greater than zero, and we're going to define the set tilde x delta to be the set of all initial conditions uh, such that I can fit a ball of radius r plus delta around the initial condition. All right, so remember r, del r epsilon is the maximum radius I can fit within any like a uh, 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 set that has uniform measure in X less than epsilon. That's the, the thing, technical thing we derived. And I'm gonna add a little bit of a slack to it now, this delta slack. And then we're gonna send the slack to, to zero. Uh, and then now I'm gonna basically take this tilde X delta and I'm gonna define this flow set, which is basically I'm gonna flow the tilde X delta through the dynamics and then for all time, that's what tilde s delta is. And then tilde s is just going to be, I'm going to basically take the limit as delta goes to infinity. A little bit of an annoying technical definition, but we'll see kind of why we need something like this in a moment. Uh, and then I'm going to, once again, define a couple more Lipschitz constants. I'm going to let LV be the Lipschitz constant of my certificate over s. And I'm going to let LQ be the Lipschitz constant of this V derivative over s. Okay. And so the theorem we're going to show is that for all eta, I, I have a, a knob here, eta and zero one. For all eta and zero one, the lead derivative of x uh, of, of the dynamics at x uh, is less than negative one minus eta times lambda v. For all x in s tilde set minus a ball around the origin, where the size of that ball scales as square root of beta r epsilon. Remember, r epsilon is like that thing. Uh, you know, that's sort of the largest ball I can fit within any bad set of measure epsilon. And it turns out we're going to basically scale a square root of that ball. Uh, okay, so it's the theorem statement clear. Basically what it says is that we're going to carve out a ball around the origin. And anything in that origin, we're just going to give up saying anything about. But in the complement of that origin uh, and in the flow set S tilde, we actually have the guarantee that the lead derivative condition holds. And that ball is going to basically send to zero as epsilon goes to zero. Okay, so let's dig into how this happened. So we're gonna fix an X in this S delta, S tilde delta. So by definition of S tilde delta, there exists an initial condition in X delta and a time t such that the flow of t starting at psi equals x, right? This is just what it means to be in s tilde delta. So the good set here is just going to be x set minus the bad set. And I claim that there must exist a psi prime in uh, x good uh, such that the L2 distance between the initial psi minus psi prime is less than r epsilon plus delta. Okay, so pictorially, right, so if, if psi is, uh, if this psi here is in x good, there's nothing to prove. So let's assume that psi is in x bad. So pictorially, what this means is that psi is in x bad. Uh, because psi is in x bad, by our technical lemma before, we know that the largest ball we can fit in x bad is the size r epsilon, right? Okay, so we can fit a ball of size r epsilon, which means that if I add any slack delta greater than zero, 
I must actually leave the, the X bat at some point, right? Because by definition of maximality of R epsilon. So if I leave X, if I leave X bat, then I'm basically in X tilde uh, delta because I, the way I, the reason, this is exactly why I define X tilde delta in this way, because it's basically saying this is the set uh, uh, such that I'm sort of ha have some, uh, it's kind of, let me go back to the definition. Right, so X tilde delta is the set of all elements that there's a, a slack of radius R epsilon plus delta away uh, from X. So I can fit a ball of size R epsilon plus delta in X. And so if I, um, so this basically guarantees that I have to actually intersect uh, X good, right? Because this ball here is contained within X, R plus delta is contained within X, and it's not contained within X bad, so it must, by definition, intersect x good. And so that's, that's kind of the pictorially what's going on here. OK. And so once you have this, once you know that you have a close by neighbor that's in the good set, then you can use incremental stability and the Lipschitz properties to basically get you exactly what you want. So let's see how this happens. So remember, we had a, a neighbor psi delta that's actually in the good set. And so what we do is we take the lead derivative of the element that's, that's kind of uh, the flow starting in the bad set. And then we compare it to the flow, uh, the lead derivative of the flow starting the good set plus the Lipschitz constant times the deviation, right? And so because psi prime is in the good set, it verifies the, the Lyapunov decrease condition. And so we can upper bound Q of the flow of psi prime by negative lambda V of the flow at psi prime, right? And that's what this first inequality is doing. Now, the second inequality then kind of uses, we then kind of uh, change V of psi prime to V of psi by using the Lipschitzness of V. And that's kind of why the second inequality picks up the lambda LV here. So once we get to this inequality, then we use incremental stability, right? We know that the flow of psi and psi prime is eventually going to converge to each other. And we know that the width of that flow is going to be upper bounded by the, the deviation of the initial conditions. So the fourth inequality uses our incremental stability assumption to bound the deviation of the flows by this class K function or uh, class KL function theta. And then the fifth inequality just uses class of the function beta in the first argument because we know that the neighbor is within R plus delta of uh, my bad initial condition. So effectively what this says is that the lead derivative of the bad point is upper bounded by negative lambda V plus some slack that depends on the size of R epsilon. And then we can take the limit as delta goes to infinity. And so basically we've shown essentially for every X in S tilde that Q of X is less than negative lambda V of X plus some Lipschitz constants times beta of R epsilon. And that's the whole argument. Uh, well, okay, almost. So the, the remaining part of the argument then is we need to sort of cancel out this flop term. And so we take a little bit, we borrow a little bit from V and we use the fact that V is minorized by the L2 norm uh, to then basically use this uh, swap to kind of kill off this extra term. And that's exactly why this inequality is only verified for all X outside of a ball because we kind of use part of the ball very close to the origin. It's that's the, when we're very close to the origin, the Lyapunov function does not allow us to kind of kill off the swap. But when we're far away from it, we can't. And that's, okay, so that is the argument. Yes. So any questions here? Okay, so what, that maybe was a little technical, but if we zoom out, what have we shown? We've shown that basically the Lyapunov condition holds for all X and S uh, tilde, except for a radius around the origin of psi square root beta R epsilon. So let's like try to actually get an end-to-end -end bound here. So if, for instance, if beta of S is less than S, so if the class K function is linear in the first argument, then the radius from our technical result, no, we know that actually the radius scales like epsilon to the one over two N. Okay. Further in order, we know from the first part that the generalization error, which is, uh, as I mentioned before, equal to the failure uh, probability if the D is uniform uh, over the set X, uh, 
uh, that generalization error is less than k over m, right? k is the number of parameters, m is the number of samples. So if we want this radius to be less than some zeta, then solving for m, right? We can basically, uh, you know, plug, uh, plug this epsilon, we can plug k over m for epsilon and solve for m, and we get that m needs to be greater than k times zeta to the minus 2n. That's the amount of trajectories that we need in order to get the certificate to hold within a uh, zeta ball around the origin. So you might know, yes, why is, you might know that this is the, the dependence is exponential in state dimension. And this is because we're asking for deterministic guarantees. I think it's unavoidable. Um, if you want to cover the whole state space, right, there's kind of no guarantee away from covering the whole state space. Uh, what's cool is we're allowed to, like we can get polynomial rates for probability, but when you really want to say, okay, over the whole state space, what happens, I think you have to pay exponential dimension. Uh, but here, there's a very nice argument that allows us to use a probabilistic argument and kind of de-randomize it to a, a deterministic argument. So in, set, in essence, there's no free lunch, right? If you really want to verify the condition at every point in X, you kind of need to check, like, you basically need to grid the space. Uh, but there's uh, here it kind of allows you to interpolate, like, between, okay, maybe I'm okay with this probabilistic type of guarantee, or no, I'm not okay with probabilistic guarantee. I need a deterministic guarantee. Well, you can kind of get both, right? You just have to choose which regime you want to operate in. Yeah, okay. So that's, uh, that's it for the, the learning, that's it for the theory part of learning stability certificates. Um, I'm gonna, maybe I'll go over a few experiments now and, I, and then after that we can take our first break. Uh, and then we will talk about imitation learning after the, the, the 20 minute break. So let's jump into some experiments. Um, before I do that, I just wanna make sure there's no questions on the theory part. It doesn't have to be on the first part, just anything I covered so far. Uh, just uh, please uh, ask if there's any questions. So if I understand your proof correctly, it's, it's um, you, you now you talk about a ball about around uh, the origin, but it's not completely restricted to, to this, right? So you only have this uh, quadratic lower bound in, on your Lyapunov function, but if you would have something else, you could in principle have a different... Uh, yes, good different point. Shape. I, yes, I, the ball is only because we have a car. Yeah, exactly. If we, right, if we had a, like a general class K lower bound, then like, the ball, the, the ball would be shaped like by the inverse of the class K function. So uh, it would look like something else. I don't know, um, depending on what norm pops up in the class K function, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know where this would be of, of use, but just uh, to, to see if, if it was understood correctly, but uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's good. That's a good point. I think the like whether it's like square root of radius or radius like that part is not important right so really like you could think of replacing this the square root here with like a class k inverse but the point is that uh it's you know it's going to be some function of r epsilon right and so it will right. actually decay to zero as r epsilon goes to zero because of the properties of class k l functions yeah yeah, yeah. cool so let's jump into some experiments. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna show you is that um, you can actually learn uh, pretty faithful level sets from data. Okay, and so we're gonna look at a damped pendulum. So this is a pendulum, like a single, you know, one link pendulum. And it's, we're gonna put a little friction there so that uh, it doesn't just oscillate forever. Uh, it actually is stable, exponentially stable towards the origin or the downward facing point. And what we're going to do is we're going to roll out m equals a thousand trajectories for t equals eight seconds, uh, uh, and we're going to discretize it to resolution 0.02, and we're going to initialize from this grid minus two two in theta and theta dot space. Okay, so the function that we fit for the Lyapunov function is actually going to be a neural network. So we're going to learn a neural Lyapunov function, uh, and uh, the way we're going to parameterize this is basically uh, v of x is equal to x transpose. L theta x, L theta x plus identity x, where L theta is a reshaped, fully connected neural network, right? So basically I take x, I run it through a fully connected uh, neural network. Uh, I make sure that the output layer is like uh, large enough so that I can actually reshape it into like an n by, you know, hidden dimension uh, matrix. And this, sorry, this should actually be LL transpose. And all right, so it's LL transpose plus identity. 
The point being that this ensures that the Lyapunov function is always greater than zero because LL transpose plus identity is positive definite, right? Um, and you add this identity here as a scaling thing, right? So that you ensure that not only is it always greater than zero, it's always, you know, v, uh, v of x is always greater than norm of x squared, right? Because this is uh, this matrix is trivially lower bounded in the PSD sense by identity. This is kind of just fixing the scaling. Okay. And so the way we enforce these constraints is that we take all the trajectories we, we do and we add this like ReLU penalty. So we, we actually use a soft loss. And what the soft loss says is that, okay, I'm gonna look over all my, all my trajectories and all my state transitions at every trajectory. And I'm going to penalize this. This is essentially H here, right? And so if H is greater than zero, I'm going to penalize it by taking a gradient. And if H is less than zero, I'm just gonna ignore the constraint. So we're solving this constraint optimization problem by making an unconstrained problem with quote unquote soft losses, right? And so the idea is we're gonna to try to drive L of theta to zero. And if L of theta is zero, then obviously, you know, all these constraints are satisfied. And we're gonna do is a gradient descent. And uh, the time derivatives here, right, uh, are actually, because, you know, I only getting a trajectory, we're actually gonna evaluate these time derivatives by finite differencing. So we use a Sagov filter in SciPy to basically compute these time derivatives or estimates of these time derivatives. And what I'm showing here is that basically I take a Lyapunov function that we learned and I plot its level sets. And then I will, and we know that level sets of Lyapunov functions are invariant. And so I want to actually show that that's true for the dynamics. So then I take the 10 level set and then I roll out from, you know, Basically, yeah, I kind of grid this, this uh, the ten level set uh, of uh, of um, uh, of the learned v, and I show that it is indeed actually invariant. So you see, we start. Uh, there's maybe a little bit of aliasing on the boundary, but really, if you start on the boundary, uh, it, these things actually do roll to the origin, uh, uh, and they respect the contours of this learned Lyapunov function. So it's important to note that these level sets are actually learned from data. They are not like you don't take the energy function no, of the pendulum and plot this. This is actually learned, this is a neural network and it's learned from data. Uh, so with enough data, you can actually faithfully construct like set invariance, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, okay, so that's like the first example, uh, but you probably wanna do more, right? Like it's okay, like, so we wanna show now that the thing you learned is actually useful for a downstream task. And the way we're going to do this, we're going to do this by appealing to adaptive control. So we're going to take the pendulum dynamics and we're going to add a disturbance function, uh, which is this function here, this uh, inner product of A plus kappa times phi of T. So this kappa of phi of T is like a random sinusoidal signal. And here the A parameters are unknown. And we're going to basically do adaptive control to try and cancel this part out. And we're going to use the Lyapunov function we learned to do this adaptive control. Uh, so this is idea. If you're not familiar with this idea, it's fine. Uh, but um, there's this idea of using um, that, like the details are really not that important, but I'll just kind of go over them briefly. Uh, there's a speed gradient algorithm from Fradkov, which is really this adaptive control algorithm that allows us to basically take the gradient of the Lyapunov function to learn the parameter a hat or a, right? So the way it works is that it tries to estimate online what the parameters are so that you can cancel them out, right? Uh, obviously, if you knew the parameters, you could set u to be equal to that and it would cancel out. So what you do then is you try to estimate the parameters from data online. And the way you form an estimate is you take the gradient of the Lyapunov function, right, of, for the nominal dynamics. Uh, but here we're actually replacing that, we're replacing the true Lyapunov function with the learned Lyapunov function and then doing the adaptation algorithm. So you can think of this like a certainty equivalence controller where we're using a certainty equivalence estimate of the Lyapunov function. And so another question is, does this work? And it turns out it actually does. So uh, these different colors correspond to various values of the gain of the, the, the disturbance signal. And you can see that um, on the x-axis is plotted theta and theta dot. So you want both of these to go to zero. And uh, sorry, that's y-axis. And x-axis is time. And what you show is that basically, in the beginning, it kind of oscillates a little bit. But eventually, it learns you know, up to so a little bit of noise how to actually reject that disturbance. So it's basically learning. Uh, up to a little bit of uncertainty how to reject the disturbance. Now, if you turn off adaptation and you just let this thing run freely, you can see basically that's what this inset plot is. And it just oscillates like crazy, right? Like, especially if you have 10x the disturbance magnitude amplification, you can see that like this pendulum is basically just like, you know, going like crazy. Um, but once you use this Lyapunov function, 
you can actually reject this disturbance. So the point is to show that you can actually use these learned the op and op functions for downstream tasks. Like uh, you, it's, it's, you, know, you don't just roll out level sets, you actually use it to solve op, uh, control problems and it still can work, which is pretty neat. Okay. Uh, the second experiment is uh, we're gonna look at this Minotaur, <clears throat> which is a, uh, like a four-legged robot uh, dog. And it has a 16 dimension state. So the reason we're looking at Minotaur is because we wanna actually study high dimensional systems. Uh, so what we're gonna do is going to subject the, the Minotaur to a random kick uh, at time zero. And kind of by design, the Minotaur has itself a simple PD controller that when you kick it a little bit, it actually can kind of like wobble back and not fall over. Right. Um, and what we're going to do is try to actually certify this behavior by learning a Lyapunov function uh, in discrete time to, to basically converge to some small ball around the origin. So basically, we're going to ask that this Lyapunov inequality V of theta of error of k plus one is less than rho times V of theta error of k plus some gamma swap. Right. And uh, so here's a picture of the Minotaur. So we're gonna do this very similar to what we did before. We're gonna do a soft loss. We're gonna fit a neural network Lyapunov function. Like we're gonna use basically the same parameterization. And uh, I wanna show you this because I wanna show you the power of the holdout set method. Uh, so what we're showing here is basically the generalization error over time uh, is going down with the number of samples. So the more samples we're giving it, the better our, our certificate is able to certify the decrease condition. But what's cool about this is that uh, well, first of all, like, you know, this number actually does go down with the number of samples, but so this green line is like a cheating estimate in that I actually just, uh, you know, sampled a whole new test set and like estimated what the true generalization error was, right? You, if you, that required basically doing double the number of rollouts. So this green line is like a number that you would effectively need double the number of samples to compute. Uh, or not double, but like, you know, this is a, this is a very accurate estimate of this. Uh, so this is like sort of the true number. By just holding out N over 10 of the data, uh, I can get a upper confidence bound that's actually pretty close to uh, the, um, the, the, true, the true number uh, that um, doesn't require you to like, you know, roll out another equal size sample of, of data. Right, so the point is just showing this that like the holdout method is the way of generating very sharp estimates. You can see when n is around 50,000, the number is actually pretty sharp. Uh, yeah, cool. So that's kind of it for this uh, first part of the talk. The next part, we're gonna transition to uh, imitation learning. We probably, given the time, will not have time to talk about uh, the regret bounds, but that's fine because the imitation learning stuff is pretty interesting. Uh, but now I think we are in a good position to take our 20 uh, minute break. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll do 